Hello to my RoboFun family and friends. I'm here with my dear colleague and friend, Dr. Cynthia McAllister. How are you, Cynthia? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Sure. I'm thrilled to have you. Um, I am Laura Hart. I am the CEO and founder of RoboFun, and we run programs for children that are creative and effective using leading edge technologies. And the tagline lately that I've been using is we help kids love to learn by making things. And uh, right now we're gearing up, no pun intended, we do a lot with Lego for summer. Um, and we have 12 weeks of summer camp for, for anyone who may be interested, go to robofun.org and you can learn more about us. If you have a child who has a difficult time with transitions and you want to come and spend an afternoon and an after school, they can check it out. You can check it out to see if this might be a place you'd like to land for a week or two or three of summer camp. Um, we run robotics, coding, Minecraft and circuitry classes all summer long, mornings, afternoons, and we're at 102nd and Broadway, and we're very excited. We have some new curriculums in both Python for coding. Uh, we have the new Lego uh, product called Spike, which as we speak, I'm putting the finishing touches on the curriculum. So come and join us. We'd love to have you. And now I'd love to turn things over to introduce Cynthia. Uh, Cynthia and I have known each other, I think now for about 36 years, in, in and out. We lost touch for maybe 25 of those, but got back in touch. Uh, so Cynthia and I both, as in our young uh, adult years in our 20s, taught at the Buckley School. And we became friends there. And uh, we, we both, I was the computer teacher, Cynthia was Tell us, what, what were you at Buckley? I was a, an assistant teacher in uh, a third grade classroom. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was my first teaching job. Wow. Mm -hmm. So uh, Cynthia, since then, has done amazing, amazing things, uh, in, in sort of culminating with developing what is called the McAllister method of really dramatically, joyfully changing uh, entrenched problems in schools, uh, especially in schools for disadvantaged children. Um, so Cynthia, let's, let's figure out how to unta uh, unpack this because mm -hmm. you have so much. What, why don't we start a little bit with your childhood? You know, mm -hmm. what happened before you arrived and decided to, to go into education? Well, um, I was really fortunate to be able to go to a, um, a university lab school as a child, uh, Burris School, it was called at Ball, on the Ball State campus. Ball State used to be a normal school where they trained teachers. And so Burris was a lab school and I went there from kindergarten through eighth grade. And now we're talking about in Indiana? Or in Indiana, State? in Muncie, Indiana. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. all right. And so Burris was um, a school where the curriculum was structured in the best progressive traditions. I remember only one or two times um, in my, throughout my childhood being involved in like a teacher directed reading or math lesson. And the rest of my memories had to do with being with my friends and having the freedom to interact with them and, you know, to move about around space. Uh, of my own free will, <laughs> um, we had uh, ample opportunities to um, uh, take place to uh, have art and music, and um, we went swimming every week. We we played. It was just it was such a great experience. And then when I went to high school, my my father sort of became convinced that the curriculum wasn't rigorous enough at my. Um, at Burris, and I had to go to the local uh, high school, and I felt like I was in, in, in prison. It was just really oppressive. I hated it, um, and I really just uh, suffered. Uh, so when I became a teacher, I was immediately drawn to, um, you know, the whole idea of, of giving children freedom to explore who they are through interactions with others, and I had a, a brilliant opportunity to be mentored by a teacher when I did my student teaching in Bangor, Maine. Her name was Mary Giard. And I got to see how a teacher implemented a program that fostered those sorts of freedoms and saw how children thrived in, you know, learning literacy and math and so forth. Okay, I'm gonna have you stop for a second. We're having that staticky sound. Oh, okay. 
but here's what I'm going to try. I'm going to just try one thing here okay. to see if we can solve it. Uh, all right, let's see uh, as we go on. So you were in Maine. Yes, I went to, uh, right after college, I went to Washington, D.C., and I, uh, I was a I worked as a receptionist in a Senate office. That was a really great experience, but, you know, didn't see a future in politics for myself. So my aunt was a librarian at the University of Maine. So I went up there to get my um, teaching certificate. Wow. And okay. I'm going to ask you to pop out and pop back yep. in. Yep. Okay. So yep. Will do. Hear us. While that's happening, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about RoboFun. Um, RoboFun is about to celebrate its 25th anniversary. Next February 27th will be our 25th anniversary. And I am, I'm over the moon that I've created something that is sustaining, that is helping kids have great learning experiences. And let's see. Hi. 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 Is that better? It is better. Oh, good. We have a very major echo. I have an echo. Uh, uh, let's try one more time. Oh, Sorry okay. about that. Mm -hmm. That's okay. It is unfortunate with all this uh, zooming and all of these platforms that we have these moments, but that's life. Uh, so we're celebrating our 25th anniversary and I can't wait. All right. <laughs> Third we're time might be the charm. Yes. <laughs> all right. Tell us more, Cynthia. So you went up to Bangor, Maine, an area I'm actually quite familiar with. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and then um, eventually I had to get New York City out of my system because I love the place. I had a, had a college friend who lived there and I went to visit frequently. And uh, when I was there, I, um, I worked for a while in an art and antique auction house mm -hmm. as the American furniture specialist and put together some sales. But again, didn't really see a future <clears throat> in the antiques world for myself. Mm -hmm. So that's when I joined the faculty at Buckley. And I worked in um, at Buckley for a year before I then went back up to Maine, where I got a teaching job. And I was there teaching, I taught kindergarten, first, second, uh, and fifth grade, before I went to get my doctorate at the University of Maine, where I studied literacy, literacy education. Uh, finished my doctorate and then moved back to the New York City area. I was at Muhlenberg College for a year and then Hofstra for two years and then went to NYU. Uh, but when I moved to New York City, uh, my children were in kindergarten and first grade and I enrolled them in the Haywood Burns School. Haywood Burns was a civil rights attorney who helped develop the first constitution of South Africa. Um, and the school was committed to you know, a social justice model of education. And um, I was attracted to the school for my children and, and interacting with the principal, she became interested in my, my methods and um, hired me to be a consultant where I worked for three years um, in my first effort to develop a school-wide pedagogical model. I'd have to add that it would be hard for a principal not to want to hire Cynthia. <laughs> um, she's so compelling and you're so clear on your ideas and, uh, oh, thank you. I, I don't know that I was as clear back then, you know, the longer the road, the more we learn. And, yep. um, that was in two, 1996 uh -huh. when uh, okay. I first came to the city. Nice. And so it's taken me that long to, now I feel like it's a well-wrought urn, you know, I feel like the. The pedagogical model um, is is functional and reasoned, and then developing a pedagogical model is one thing. Uh, creating the conditions in which it will thrive, you know, be yeah. secured and sustained within the complex bureaucratic systems of schooling is another thing entirely. Yeah. And also uh, figuring out how to respond when the status quo establishment comes to murder you is another thing <laughs> which happens a lot <laughs> so uh, and is probably the major reason why we don't ever see change in our school system because um our systems of schools are thousands of years old and uh are the they that old 
Yes, the um, the structure of school as we know it. This um, comes from the scholarship of um, Michael Cole, uh, tracks it back to ancient Sumer. And the excavations of schools then show the desks in rows facing the teacher with a knowledge dissemination transmission model of pedagogy that's still in place in schools. We spend about 86% of school time transmitting information uh, with the intention of having children memorize. And so these systems haven't really changed. And what's grown up is a $700 billion uh, education industrial complex wow. that, uh, you know, people are involved in this who get money from it are intent on keeping it in place. And so at every level from the academy, you know, down to, you know, teacher unions to um, uh, curriculum developers, everyone who has a stake in schools as they are, you know, it's, it's sort of against their interest to change. So that's been, a, I suppose, you know, when I started this 30 years ago, I was so naive, you know, thinking that, wow, when, when I first started doing work and we started seeing the outcomes and achievement just really soar. It's remarkable when you give kids freedom, you know, to, to carry out their intentions to become competent, just what they put into it. And so it shows on achievement outcomes. And I thought, oh, my, my goodness, everyone's going to be, you know, excited to make sure more kids get these opportunities. And it was the opposite. You know, they, um, they were really threatening. Um, Yes, and the efforts to close it down were quite successful to the point where right now I'm not working in schools, you know, despite um, the fact that this model um, was used. It's in the public record in um, six failing schools to make them successful over the course of a few years. Mm -hmm. So I do want to add that uh, what, what is difficult about hearing all of this, and, and not that I don't agree with you, is that there's always in every school a number of people that really want the best for kids and um and really try to make that happen and i think that uh aside from this major complex that is trying to keep things the way they are there are great principals and there are great teachers mm -hmm. uh, it's just a constant battle with so many other factors yeah right right yeah and it, I don't think, um, you know, the major decision makers in the system are um, typically not the teachers themselves. And right. uh, anyway, it is complex. And right. So describe your method. Well, um, so it start. I'll, I'll describe it from, you know, sort of like my own experiences with children. When I was a kindergarten teacher, I was at the time taking an ethnography class. And, you know, I'd had the um, experience, as I mentioned, of working with this brilliant first grade teacher who basically told the kids, you know, during writing time, for example, or reading time, you can, you can have freedom to read what you want, to read with who you want, to move around the room as you wish, um, you know, to speak your own thoughts. You have freedom, but you, in exercising your freedoms, you need to do what you need to do in order to improve as a reader. And so basically, that's the fundamental basis of my model. There are these freedoms, but the freedoms need to be um, exercised uh, responsibly so that kids build their own competencies. Right. And so a lot of people hearing this might go, oh, my God, you're just letting kids do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think that's both true and not true. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you want yeah. To no. That? In fact, it's sort of like I use this example with teachers. When you go into a teacher's room and typically there are you know, rules posted on the wall somewhere about what kids can do. And when there are freedoms, there are a lot more rules. It's like in a democracy, there are you know, extensive um, freedoms. And um, freedom is very, it's, it's complex. There are a lot of conditions to the freedom. In fact, that idea goes back to Rousseau, who talked about conditional liberties. Um, but um, so the, what, what my methods are basically in, you know, as I worked in, in schools over the years, I was always trying to make things more successful. 
you know, to, to amp up achievement. And so continuously read the behavioral science research on learning and psychology. Uh -huh. And there's this um, body of psychology called normative psychology. And it says, really, we, we change, um, we, we develop based on our efforts to conform with the social norms of the primary group. So it's called normative psychology. And so I really, that idea really um, appealed to me. So my model is basically a set of rules for like games to be played in school. And so there's a game for reading together in a group, a small group of less than six kids, five kids. Um, there's a game for sharing writing. There's a game for learning math. There are these games and the games, the rules of the games are outlined in these page long rubrics. And so when I do professional development, and the rubrics are the same for kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. And so when I um, uh, do professional development, I work with teachers and principals to help kids and teachers learn the rules of the game. And teaching is a process not of transmitting knowledge, but of helping kids norm their behavior, regulate their behavior to the rules of the game. So, so that's basically. One way I'm thinking about this is uh, that when I went to public school in um, upstate New York and Del Mar, New York, um, most of it I really actually hated um, because I think the norms were not about intellectual curiosity. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I had to kind of tamp down my own being to mm -hmm. fit into the norms. Um, I then graduated from high school a year early and um, my mother suggested I didn't go to college right away, but I went <clears throat> for what's called a postgraduate year, <clears throat> excuse me, to the Emma Willard School. And I thought it was a little nutty, but I was like, all right, I'll try this. Mm -hmm. And I was, the norms there were so different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I got my, you know, I did fine in high school, uh, in public high school, but I got my first C at Emma Willard and I was mm -hmm. like, oh my God, this is different. I have, you know, like my expectation level of what was asked of me and mm -hmm. what the support I was given was so, the norms were different. Right. Uh, yeah. The standards were much higher of what they felt I could achieve. So mm -hmm. is that sort of what you're trying to do is raise what is the norm in every environment? Yeah, uh, yes. And, um, and there, there are a couple ways I want to respond to that. Uh, first of all, that what we do is we help children become aware of the broader expectations that society has for their learning. So we direct kids to access the state standards and the curriculum directly. And so we'll take the chemistry curriculum, for example, and we'll, you know, lay it out and say, here it is. You and your group need to figure out how you're going to tackle it, you know, how you're going to chunk it up. And so what it's you're sort of do. like giving the kids the teacher's manual and yes. saying, hey, yeah, this right. Is, that's great. That's yeah. right. Now, and so, and we also, in high school, we show the kids the regents exams. You know, mm -hmm. this is what's going to be expected of you at the end of the year. You know, and they use that as a tool for guiding their own study. And then we show them how to use, um, uh, not depend on teachers to tell them things, but to access sources, free sources of information. So on YouTube, for example, there's a lot of, um, I remember having a lesson with kids in, it was in a, um, a um, living environments class. And these kids didn't, they had failed their living environments regents. And I said, listen, I held up my phone. Anything you need to know to pass the regents is on your phone. You know, you can access it through YouTube if you know what questions to ask. So, um, so anyway, we're, we're, when, when kids understand what's expected of people their age, they want to outdo that. You know, they want to, they want to strive beyond those limits. So that's one thing. And then um, the other thing is giving them freedom to access the perspectives of others and learn how to do that, you know, so how to exchange opinions and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then when you do that, the kids draw on who they are, their propensities and their talents and everything. And so the curriculum is automatically individualized. Right. So, so that's one way. The, the big challenge of progressive methods over the last couple hundred years has been how do you uh, honor uh, independence and provide freedom and make sure 
kids learn what they need in order to participate successfully in society, in order to learn what society expects. That's been the big difficulty, that notion of what um, Jerome Bruner called the fourth pedagogy. And um, so I think that's what my model succeeds in doing. And, um, Can you repeat that? The what pedagogy? The fourth pedagogy. Fourth. So okay. yeah, the, so um, the first is imitation, and the second is didactic instruction, and the third is total freedom, and the fourth is freedom with you know the um, learning what's expected. And mm -hmm. so that fourth pedagogy has been what's been kind of elusive, and and you really need a successful pro so-called progressive model, democratic model, in order for people to learn how to exercise their freedoms in the service of their own successful participation in society. And so that uh, has been a big dilemma in the problem of equality of education opportunity in our country. I have to just say that um, this afternoon, my, my son is walking in his graduation from college. Oh, college. congratulations. Not today, but we're dri driving up and mm -hmm. you know, we arrange this so that it's convenient for me to be able to get. And my mind is just, you know, and I thought, yeah, I'll get through this interview and then, you know, get in the car. I I'm just blown away with what you're saying and, and mm -hmm. you're with Cynthia. I mean, I've known you oh. for 36 years, I think. And, I haven't really heard the depth of your mm -hmm. your thoughts, and mm -hmm. uh, we only have about ten more minutes. But you will, mm -hmm. if you are willing, I think we need to do a few more sessions of this because mm -hmm. people need to hear this. I mean, actually, mm -hmm. where my son is graduating, Hampshire College, is real example of this type of learning, right. where mm -hmm. kids are put in charge more, but with support and yes with freedoms but with lots of rules around those mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um i know that what i just said doesn't directly relate to what you're talking about but it's just very mm -hmm. very moving your mm -hmm. expertise and um why don't uh in the last 10 minutes mm -hmm. what if you walked through a success story of a mm -hmm. school Mm -hmm. um, I know that I was in one of those on the Upper West Side with you maybe mm -hmm. eight years ago. Mm -hmm. um, right. With that, well, that that was. Um, I suppose the um, there are two schools that really um, demonstrate the success of this kind of model. I don't want to say this is the be all and end all, but I do want to say that our education system hasn't been asking the right questions and uh, tackling the correct problem. And so I feel like, you know, I've done a pretty fair job of trying to identify the problem and, you know, figured out a way of, of one possible way of tackling it. But one of the schools was on the Brandeis campus, which was chronically low performing for decades. Mm -hmm. And it was closed down under the Bloomberg administration, Brandeis School. And um, that was during the small schools mo movement. The idea was smaller schools are more successful, which proved not to be true. It's what you do, not how big the school is. But um, anyway, so the um, um, the network that this school belonged to recruited me to um, direct what they called the um, McAllister Learning Cultures Initiative. My model is called Learning Cultures because it develops cultures of learning in schools. And so this was one of the schools. And it, in, let me see, 2013, or 2012, I can't remember, 2013, I think it was, it was the in the lowest 1% of all schools in the city. Um, the, you know, the behavior problems were obviously one of the issues. Um, the graduation rate was, I think, 38%. Um, anyway, it was just typical failing school, but, you know, uh, a very, you know, Depressing. extreme model of that right. and anyway so we we implemented the model there my model has first level changes that happen in classroom practice and then second level changes that are bureaucratic systems that we put in place and I have a distributed model of responsibility where teachers are recruited to implement the changes and within four years the graduation rate doubled to I think like 83 percent and um, uh, the violent disruptive incidents just plummeted. It was, you know, it was a real case of dramatic change. Um, and then there was another school, the same thing happened on the Columbus school campus, Columbus in the Bronx. 
this particular school had a student body of 95% high poverty and 80 some percent were English learners. And that's traditionally a really difficult group of children. There are a lot of um, temporary um, homelessness involved in that population. Anyway, um, this group, I worked with the school to open the first at first ninth grade and then they phased in a new grade every year. Yep. Um, and the first group to graduate with my model for all four years um, doubled the graduation rate of English language learners citywide and surpassed the citywide graduation level and scored in levels of um, excellence, academic excellence, on a par with uh, Bronx Science and Stuyvesant High School. Is there a reason you're not mentioning names of schools? Oh, that was High School of Language and Innovation. And the other, okay. the first one I mentioned was um, High School for Green Careers. Okay. All right. And um, so, so these, yes, that, that school. And so when you look at the numbers in terms of um, educational attainment and, and life projected earnings, it was staggering the opportunities that, you know, were uh, in store statistically for these kids. Right. And um, so it was a case in both situations of successfully narrowing the achievement gap and improving equality of education opportunity, which has been a goal that has not been achieved in the 70 years since Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, Obama, the Obama administration put four and a half billion dollars into school transformation without a single example of success. And so this is a real, his, these were historic um, achievements and it's all in the public record. And the fact that it's not happening now in schools is, is another story. You know, it's that, tragic. You know, it's tragic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell us um, what you have coming up and if people want to contact you who are listening to this and would like to move their school learn more can they email you how, how sure. would you yes my um email address is my name cynthia dot mcallister i'm gonna put it in the chat so yeah. i can't always type so well cynthia dot um, c c a l l i s t yep at nyu dot edu so a part of your life is teaching kids how to be great teachers or not kids mm -hmm. everybody's great right. uh -huh. right, but mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh undergraduates and graduates mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so I have two questions for you yeah. how do you address teaching kids right, or people who want to become teachers mm -hmm. that's my first question and what school reform efforts are you going to be pursuing in the fall mm -hmm. that well, you're getting you know, um, I mean, teacher education has been in like there. There's this kind of conundrum because the current industrial school uh, goes back to the the early 20th century, and teaching was a function within the system, like a conveyor belt where knowledge was transmitted. And so, teacher education is kind of in an identity crisis right now. You know. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's sort of followed federal policies. So, for example, after Bush, there was you know no child left behind in reading first, and there was all this fanfare about how you have to teach, you know, methods that have been proven and effective. You know, a lot of phonics and that sort of thing, which proved not to be correct. And <laughs> and now we're on to something entirely different. So that's that's a problem that re requires maybe a longer conversation. Um, what I'm involved right now is. I'm um, working with my mentor of um, 25 years, Edmund Gordon, Edmund W. Gordon, who is a, a prominent psychologist and civil rights leader. And we've been, uh, we're working on a book and worked on a year long seminar on um, reconceptualizing the practice of equality of education opportunity. And so this book really takes this, you know, looks at um, after Brown versus Board, the Supreme Court, in making that decision, established desegregation as criteria for equality of education opportunity. What we're arguing is that while that was good for society, it wasn't good for education. Uh, desegregation, the racial mix, is not, um, there's, there's not evidence to support that that improves the educational quality, especially for children minority children and disadvantaged children. What we're proposing instead is that we need to be concerned with ad adequacy 
of educational inputs, of educational experiences. And we need to have new criteria. The, the Supreme Court needs to revisit this. So our, our book is about this, this idea. And our thesis is that what really matters the most is the attributes of the students themselves, their aspirations, their sense of self-control. Those things really have you know, proven to be far more effective than any other measures, school facilities, curriculum quality, or teachers um, in achievement. So in, in, could I put it this way and correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. that kids need to be supported in developing their own goals. Yes, their own goals and their own um, their own sense of competence and their own strategies for competence mm -hmm. and you know the um, really intentionality. So th my model in this, the premise of the book is that we that schooling needs to be concerned with the development of the intentional states of children and and help them learn how to carry out their own intentions. Mm -hmm. And that's a different way of thinking about schooling than we've been thinking about. Yes, yes, but it's very exciting mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned to me on the phone that you're going to be starting to work directly within a school in the mm -hmm. fall. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I'm going to, um, uh, as part of my work at NYU um, as a teacher, I'm going to work in a school to supervise student teachers. And the school that I'm working in is the Maker School. I might be getting the title wrong, but Amy Pillar is the principal. And when in her first or second year as a teacher, I coached her at the Jacob Reese School in my That's model. Great. And she became one of the, you know, resident experts on the McAllister model. And so it'll be fun to go back to the school where she's now a principal and work with her teachers because we're committed to the same ideas of, you know, freedom and, and so responsibility. Six, eight months from now, people could go if it's okay with Amy and see your work in action at her school. Yes, I mean, I'm not exactly sure to the degree to which her teachers are using the curriculum because schools are within these larger systems that have expectations for the curriculum. So I, I don't really know. Yep, of course. Um, okay. So if people wanted to learn more about your work right now, where would they go? Is there a website? Oh, the Well, I have a new book called... Oh. Um, a pedagogical design for human flourishing. Um, and a, a pedagogical design for human flourishing, transforming schools with the McAllister model. Okay. I and got... it's published by Routledge. So they could find your book? Yes. Okay. You, they can get it on Amazon or through Routledge. Um, yeah, a pedagogical design for human flourishing, and then it'll pop up in the search engine. All right, I, I'm giving people your website. Is that also? A yes, sure, question? that's fine. Uh huh. Yeah. I will get the pedagogical design out of not from me writing it because I know I'll get pedagogy wrong. Yep, I got it. Wow, it comes up right away. Mm -hmm. So here we go. Um. And how long has your book been out? Oh, just a month. Ah. Yeah, I just finished it last year. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And then That's the next one will be out in the fall, I hope. Fall or next spring. So you're not letting grass grow under your feet? You're no, I have a lot of things to write. <laughs> I have, um, yeah, I have a, a few more projects lined up. Great. Yeah. Well, I am incredibly appreciative of having you and of, you know, when it's funny when you have friendships, you don't always hear your friends brilliant. Mm -hmm. And I really heard some amazing things this morning. Well, and thank you for having me. Sure. It's been really fun. Sure. I'm going to do a few housekeeping things before we uh, call it. Um, I am the CEO and founder of RoboFun. RoboFun is 24 and a half years old. Uh, I have actually a background in painting and sculpture and worked with the MIT scientist, uh, computer scientist and uh, disciple of Piaget, Dr. Seymour Papert. And our work at RoboFun is all about helping kids love to learn through making things uh, in robotics, in coding, in all sorts of STEAM activities. Uh, we're getting ready for our summer. Uh, we are at robofun.org. 
we work in about 100 schools in New York City, as well as our studio on 102nd and Broadway. And if you have any questions, come check us out. And uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful, sunny, at least in New York City, uh, Wednesday. So thank you again, Cynthia. It's been oh, thanks. fantastic. Thanks so much for having me.